Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Page One, the podcast that likes to speak to writers of all kinds about their writing careers, find out how they got into the industry and try and get as many hints and tips as possible. Now, if you're watching this on YouTube, and yes, we have a YouTube channel, I highly recommend if you're listening to this on podcast to come to the YouTube channel and watch this episode, you will be able to see me and Tarek uh, wearing our festive jumpers. Or do we? Do you just wear that every... This is a standard attire for me, yeah. Just yeah. every day is Spider-Man. Let's see it stand up a bit. Show us it. You've got my Spider-Man. Spider-Man Christmas jumper. Represent. I've got my Batman. Marcus, and Marcus for the first time, DC, I'm revealing to... Choice. I'm revealing to... Um, our viewers what my house actually looks like in the background there wow i don't think i've seen that house before yeah yeah Mark. i mean there's some people in the background but also yeah i've got just a couple of trees there uh, nice but, yeah. little bridge across yeah. between wings yeah. of the house is it i mean it's a it's a small it's a small house but yeah you you make do you make do <laughs> um but uh, i said it was a special episode it obviously is a festive episode we're releasing this uh, just before christmas and um we are joined by not one but two very special guests uh one returning guest and one completely new guest yes indeed our first guest is nick binge who appeared on the podcast uh, way back in episode 157 he told us all about his journey to publication with ascension his amazing speculative book that we think will appeal to fans of interstellar arrival annihilation and it's received rave reviews including from some guy called steve king I think is that is it his no name? I don't know. I've never heard of him before, but yeah, apparently he's quite a big guy. Yeah, and uh, also uh, joining Nick, who will appear in a moment, is uh, a newcomer to the pod, as I said, another fellow Edinburgh based writer or close to Edinburgh. Uh, Dave Goodman is a prolific author of short stories uh, in renowned sci fi magazines such as uh, Clark's World, Analog, and uh, where his latest story, Hull Run, has just been published. And in fact, at the time of recording today, he's just sold another story to Clark's World. His fans are short story machine. His fourth story to Clark's World in like two Leave or some three space years. For the rest of us, Dave. Exactly. Jesus. And uh, he will. He also has his debut novel coming out next year, and we'll be able to uh, talk to him about that. So why don't we now say hello to Nick and Dave? Hello. Hello. And Nick's got a friend with him. I see. Got a little. I, this is the official um, page one festive episode mascot um, nice. that I brought along. Uh, terrifying. Not, not page one, Matt. Just the festive episode. I kill him at the end of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yeah, loving your Christmas jumper as well. Can we see a bit of that? A bit more of that, Nick. It's the eye of. Sauron. Oh, nice. Oh, excellent. Oh, we've gone. For, we've all got gone for uh, movie comic themed Christmas jumpers. It's good. Yeah, I like it. Good work. Like good work. I just have this extremely hot hat uh which i'm going to take off actually but it's okay because i have a i have a virtual <laughs> oh, smart a virtual you planned hat. that yeah. planned that what you gonna do? <laughs> um now uh, regular listeners will know that uh, at this stage we normally say um we'll get straight into the podcast after a quick advert for our writer's notebook at which point we cue uh well played and recorded advert uh but Nick and Dave being, I think, possibly our biggest fans of, of Page One. Is that fair to say? I'd say so. I have that. Uh, no, uh, have requested to do a live reading of the advert. So From um, from memory. Yeah, from memory. Uh, so I'm going to hand yeah. it over to them now. <clears throat> Let's try and get on my like, uh, like mid-90s movie trailer voice. Um, <laughs> preparation. Don't do it, man. In Don't a I'm world. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I do In a world. Guys. Whether the blank page. Um, all right. The blank page. To some, it's terrifying. An obstacle to overcome. But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity. A blank canvas to be filled with all the adventures and characters in our head. Are we swapping? Are we doing? Are yeah, we that's you now, Dave. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Killing the vibe. Overcome that. I was, I was getting well, excited. We all know. <laughs> The best advice for a writer is, say it with me, guys. Right. 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 Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start to pull the threads of what you've written together? 
What about that character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What did she have? And where did she leave that MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those taut thrillers you like to read or those epic multi-volume novels, that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? Structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organize all the thoughts we have about the stories we want to tell. We might be on a train, scribbling down something on a scrap paper, <laughs> or maybe make a quick note on our phone on a meeting. Is this how it sounds to everyone else normally, man? <laughs> <laughs> well, like the greatest dad ever. <laughs> Other times we'll have to we'll have time to carefully jot it down in a notebook. All methods that can work, but are also a bit haphazard. This is this is slightly different to the script you guys read. Um, it can be difficult to pull in the thoughts from each of these ideas and apply them to whatever it is we're writing. Sometimes we even forget where we made that note that we just know would solve the problem we're now encountering. And that, yeah, that's, that is, is when we realized that it's not just the story that needs structure and planning. It's the way we gather all our thoughts about it as well. And so we made page one. And here's, 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 oh, here's, nice. Yeah, here's nice. Here's nice. Product placement there. Excellent. Good work. For, for those listening, I'm, I'm holding up a page one notebook. If that doesn't sell you at least three notebooks, um, then <laughs> I will fired. Dave's hat. <laughs> it's virtual hat. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks for that. Um, I'm, we'll, we'll get back to you as to whether or not <laughs> we use that version of the ad. Um, but yeah, no, thank you for joining us for this special episode. So normally, um, if you're joining us for the first episode, first of all, poor you, I would definitely recommend yeah, going to see. Really other... for first episode. <laughs> yeah, exactly, go and listen to other episodes. But secondly, um, normally we would explore uh, the, the guest journey, writing journey from the start and find out what they've been writing recently. And we will cover some of that, but because it's a different type of episode we really just wanted to jump in and say what were your writing highlights of the year as in your personal writing highlights of the year um and uh we can all have a go at this but uh i'm going to start with nick cool um that's a good question it's been a busy year in a lot of ways um i think the, there there are obvious ones that i can point to like my book coming out um, but I think I'm, I'm going to go for slightly more, um, interesting and esoteric ones, um, that, that occurred to me when I think back at 2023, I think one of the absolute writing highlights, probably one of the highlights of my writing life was, uh, discovering that one of the readers of Ascension, I need, I need to, I need to frame this in some context. If you haven't read the book or you don't know about the book, yeah. right. But the, the, the book is, is, is framed as a kind of pastiche of kind of gothic fiction. So it's it's an epistolary narrative. It's written through kind of a bunch of found letters that are discovered in a in a in a kind of uh in a care institute uh years after the fact. Um and there's all kind of little footnotes and things like that to suggest kind of how the letters were arranged and how they were put together and blah blah blah. Um and, and some made up footnotes of like academic papers and stuff like that that discuss the letters. Um, anyway, I had a reader who first I noticed on Goodreads who was like commenting on other people's reviews being like, oh, I love this so much, but I don't, I don't understand. Like it says Nicholas Binge on the cover, but like, what did he do? Did he, did he find the letters? Did he present them? Did he put them together? <laughs> and then she emailed me actually directly and was like, I can't find this paper that you quote, like this academic paper that I'd made up, right? Um, in the book, right? So she'd bought it. She'd completely bought the conceit. Um, and she thought the letters were real. Um, and but she the like, these letters include like all sorts of like weird yeah. time I mean, I, I think it's monsters. Fair, fair to say. Yeah, exactly. By the end of the book, all sorts of weird shit has happened. So. Yeah, all sorts of weird shit is happening. So if nothing else, I like I commend her ability to suspend disbelief. Whatever universe she lives in, that she could she could openly accept all of that as being Yeah, that's brilliant. I, I'm envious of her. Uh but if nothing else, I was like, that is a writing achievement. I have written a book so preposterously ridiculous and someone has bought it as real. <laughs> so that was a highlight for me. I've Excellent. I've been living off that for a while. Brilliant. Nice. And uh, 
Dave, what about you? You as as I said at the start, I mean, uh, yeah, let's let's with you at least let's do a little bit more of a dive into <laughs> since you've not been on the podcast before. Um, as I said at the start, you've you've written lots of short stories. You've got um, a book coming out uh, next year. Do you want to tell the listeners a little bit about you know your your writing journey in a in a summation in a small tiny way. tiny yeah. yeah um yeah absolutely yeah I've, so I've, I've been writing since i was very small um kind of um, primary school really um and uh i i, I kind of realized quite early on in life that it was a thing that i found easy that other people apparently didn't find all that easy but that i would get praise from adults for doing uh so i was like brilliant i'll do a bit more of that um and wrote little short stories, little two or three page short stories all the way through school and then started writing longer ones when I got to university. And um, and then I kind of wrote, wrote and submitted a few short stories in my early 20s and then basically stopped because that was back in the day when you had to like literally post stuff to the other side of the world mm-hmm. in a lot of cases and wait for a little slip of paper to come back with a rejection. Yeah. Um, and I did that three or four times, got straight rejections, which is good because the stories were awful and uh, basically gave up and started writing novels. Instead, I wrote a NaNoWriMo novel in 2005. And then over the next sort of 10 years, I wrote about another five or six novels, but it was always very sort of um, up and down. You know, I would write for three months and then not write for six months. And about five years ago, I started writing much more regularly and I'd had lots of practice, but I hadn't ever submitted anything. I hadn't been querying my novel, hadn't gone into the query trenches at all. So it was kind of I was I, it fit. if you if you were just looking at my career from the outside you'd be like wow this guy came out of nowhere but what in reality what I was doing yeah. is just sort of crouching in a cave typing and not not submitting anything learning but not really doing it in public in any way so out of the gate I was extremely fortunate to sell my first first submitted story like the first story that I submitted since 2005 um was to Clark's World and that sold and then I sold uh two more uh and I've told the the one I sold this morning it's my fourth to Clark's World and I sold two others to to Analog as well which has been fantastic and three of those sales were this year as well so this has been a a bumper year for the for the short stories except they're not really short stories they're sort of eight eight to ten thousand words novelettes which is like Mm -hmm. a tenth of a novel um which is actually quite a chunky bit of work but it's uh it's good because you get to sort of do a bit more than you would in a sort of three thousand word short story, but you, um, you you're, you're not having to write a whole novel. Um, yeah, time sink is a lot less, isn't it? Yeah, hundred percent. And yeah, I got agented at almost exactly the same time, like within five days of selling that first short story. I, I I'd submitted my novel for the first time and I got an agent. So that was a that was a heck of a week uh, back in two twenty twenty one, and I've been writing novels since then and writing more short stories and just kind of building on that initial success and uh, yeah i was very very happy to sell a novel in june of uh, this year uh, which has, hasn't been announced yet so i can't tell you who it's with i can't tell you the title but i can tell you it's a spy thriller um and it's hopefully coming out towards the latter half of next year and i can awesome. tell you that it's great yeah, that's exactly. what i can say about it but it's a fantastic book yeah, I've because not, I've not read it, but the concept of it, which you know, yeah, you've we, we've, before, we've heard the pitch really off cool. air, and yeah, yeah, it's very good. Yeah, I was I was going to say as well. Obviously, we've got both of you on. Uh, we know you because we're on this in the same um, writing Discord and stuff. But uh, you two as well have. We spoke a bit about this when you were on the podcast before, Nick. But you're it. You've got a small critique group that you're both part of, and it is. I think it's the most intensive critique group that I've ever. I've ever heard of. Do you want to let people know how that works? Yeah, we, um, yeah, so it was me, um, uh, and, uh, a few other people, some, some other names you might know, um, uh, and no, notably in, in, in the UK, Sean Lawless as well, uh, who, who writes the, the Gale Song trilogy, mm-hmm. um, uh, who is amazing. Um, and, um, and a bunch, uh, a few, a few, um, a few writers in the US as well, who we've connected with, um and it's, it's quite a small group it's what are we six seven something like that we, there's eight of us in the server and, and there's currently five or six of us writing there's five or six of us currently writing actively, there's people because yeah. of life circumstances they're not writing at the moment or or kind of they're 
they dropped out um of kind of for the time being um of the kind of regular writing and critiquing but essentially there's five or six of us and um we meet i mean the idea is that we meet every single week um we have opportunity to submit work every single week if we submit work every single week you can pretty much guarantee that it's going to be read by the other people who are reading and submitting so kind of at least four or five other people um and that can be up to you know uh sometimes it's a few thousand words sometimes it's five thousand words sometimes it's up to ten thousand words um i i, I almost dropped like I almost dropped 17,000 words a few weeks back on the group uh, in one week. Um, that was a busy week. Yeah, that was guy, a so, crazy week. So do you guys like drop stuff in as you're writing your, your book? Do you, like, do you write what you've, do you drop in what you've written, been written? That yeah, week? yeah. So what I, I think we all have slightly different processes. What I like to do is like, as I'm writing a book, I'll write a chapter, I'll draft it a little bit, but like, because I'm quite a because I'm quite a discovery writer and I don't always know where I'm going. And I like to kind of firm that up early on. It's nice to kind of write something and then other people read it. And then, and we don't really do the kind of like close line edit. Like I'm not expecting people to be like, you know, correcting kind of phrasing and stuff like that. It's more the, 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 the real benefit is having the meeting at the end of the week and we just bounce around ideas and people will be like, you know, this kind of, this characterization that's not really landing or that's not really working i'll be like okay what about this and like some of the best moments will come out of sometimes i'll submit something and then for half an hour the four other people in the group will be talking about it and bouncing ideas off each other and i'm not saying anything for like for like 20 minutes and i'm yeah. just sitting there taking notes being like that's a fucking great idea that's <laughs> a great idea as well like and thinking about how i might want to integrate it and a lot of the time kind of people come up with stuff and i go you know, I don't say this, but I'm sure we all on some level go, no, nah, nah, that's not a good idea. I'm not going to use that. <laughs> that's rubbish. <laughs> um, but uh, but like it's just having the discussion, which is it's become a hugely valuable part of my writing practice. So as intensive as it is, like it's it really helps me to kind of conceptualize and and uh, understand what's working and what's not working with how I'm writing. Yeah, I can, I can see how that would be hugely helpful to, you know, the when you're actually in the process of writing to, you know, like I'm currently in the middle of writing my one and I've definitely hit a bit in the middle where I'm trying to work things out. So if you were able to bounce, you know, with people that re have read the story, so you're not having to explain it in a bad way, which is what I normally do. Um, so they've actually <laughs> read it, uh, they... they that you're then getting their feedback and ideas for how it can progress. And like you say, Nick, maybe none of them will be right, but even that discussion might help you pro decide how to proceed. Yeah, it. yeah definitely. Yeah. It almost always does. And it's it's interesting because logistically, so I, I have founded and run a couple of other writing workshops uh, that were kind of classic Milford style workshops where you know, the whole group reads one piece of work and then you sit around in a circle and every person has their say and 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 kind of classic Milford, the, the author is not supposed to respond until the end and it, it done badly, it can feel basically like a hazing ritual yeah. <laughs> and it can be really quite unpleasant. Um, whereas this is this is a much more logistically efficient process because you, everyone submits their stuff everyone reads, everyone comments, and we're talking in those comments, as Nick says, occasionally, if you see a typo, you'll fix it, but you are, you're commenting on, you know, places where you lose interest, or you get bored, or you're confused, or, um, or you, you're just not sure about something, or you're not buying the motivations of a character, or whatever it is, and then the, the, the reader, the, the, the person who submitted that piece of work, gets all these comments over the course of the, the week, and they're able to start working on them immediately if they want to but then they can take a bunch of notes and then that means our meeting is not like this ritualized sit around in a circle type thing it's more like the author then comes into the workshop and says i had a, i had i wanted you to expand on that point you made and yeah. we have a we have a discussion and it's very fast and very efficient and we can normally get through four or five people's work at most in a in a hour to hour and a half long meeting um and it's brilliant it's yeah i don't tend to submit quite as hot off the press as nick does like he'll drop a chapter every week whereas i tend to sort of write two or three chapters ahead and then drop them uh kind of with a bit of a lag uh just because i i like to i like to get far enough ahead in the story that i'm not sort of changing direction based on 
comments I got yeah. last week sort of thing. Because yeah. to me, that feels like it would interfere too much with the way that I write. Um, and, and I tend to drop short stories or novelettes just as fully finished projects. I'm just like, here you go, here's 10,000 words to read. But, you know, as long as you don't take take the mech and, like, continually drop 15,000 word chapters. On yeah, the I've done that can, once. You, like, yeah, 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 yeah exactly. totally. <laughs> you can get, but you can get, you can work your way through a novel. You can get a whole novel through this group in in sort of 12 to 15 weeks, which is not possible in any other sort of workshop format that I know. And and just as a group, we're very close knit. We, um, the American contingent all came over for next launch and we had a fantastic time in Scotland. And yeah, it's, it's, I I basically bullied my way in because Nick was asking for beta readers for a piece of work and um, I like dropped all my sort of creepy gun knowledge on him i'm not a gun guy just to be clear but i just happen to know a lot about guns I, don't ask me why but I, that's what they all say dave <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. but i just was like i can help you with your gun stuff and your technical stuff and all the other stuff that is error filled in this story and i and you know over and then he kept talking about this workshop and i was like can i can i maybe join can i can you make and he proposed me as a new member and and i joined and it's been absolutely fantastic do you have to go through some sort of hazing ritual to join uh, there's a lot of gifts. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of in jokes. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of good chat. <laughs> yeah, but and the, yeah, and yeah. the sacrificing of the goat as well. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah well, we do that. That's yeah, that's not part. Yeah. That's not part part of the group. Yeah, just, <laughs> yeah. yeah. that's that's just fun markup. Uh, All right, sorry. <laughs> No, the, the very specific uh the gun chat uh that uh that brought Dave in uh was uh was in a novella that I wrote which um uh which 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 I may have just sold but I'm not really allowed to talk about um but it was a novella that I wrote where um uh as as Dave will know uh, certainly when I'm drafting for the first time and I get caught up in my ideas and I'm getting excited about the plot I fly very much by the seat of my pants when it comes to any kind of research like I I when I'm in the flow of writing, I mm-hmm. very rarely stop to double check whether something is accurate. I'll just kind of go, yeah, this is, sounds about right. Yeah. Um, you know, and then on redrafts, I'll go and I'll try and double check things. And But sometimes I'll miss things because I just don't know, right? Um, and I don't know anything at all about guns. Uh, like the only stuff I know <laughs> about guns is from watching like cop shows on TV and stuff like that, the, the occasional mention of things. Uh, I don't even watch that much kind of military based stuff or read that much military based stuff. So I think I had a character who had uh, was had assassinated another character who was near the opening of the book from across a room um, with with a rifle had like sniped him or something like that or shot them with a rifle. Um, and I just put down like a random gun in there like this. I think you rifle. you googled cool sniper rifle. And I think I just googled the first Google. thing you cool, find, cool yeah. rifle or something like that. Um, <laughs> and Dave was reading it and was like, "This is an anti tank gun. Like if you shot a person <laughs> with it, they would just explode into red mist. I <laughs> think you wouldn't even have a body." <laughs> I was like, "Oh, okay. That's probably not use that then." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that yeah, could gun still stuff. work. Yeah. <laughs> but that is the stuff that people pick up on because I had a in my first book I had a revolver with a safety and someone oh, and was like yeah. what the fuck you don't there's no such thing as a safety on a revolver you're like you stupid twat like this is, this is the point. <laughs> I gave up reading and I was like right I mean so it's something people pick I was up just on. trying to help Derek <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I will say I will relate a, a, a hack that I think I got from Corey Doctor. I think I heard him talking about this on a podcast or, or in one of his articles. Basically, whenever he needs to write gun stuff, he always adds the word customized. Oh, to, nice. Yeah. Oh, to, so you'll be like a customized Glock 17 or whatever. And as a result, all the all the gun enthusiasts will be like, oh, I wonder what the customization is. And they, you know, they'll bend, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll be like, well, it, it seemed to have some sort of double safety switch, so it can't be, you know, so they just get lost in that little rabbit hole trying to work out what the customization is and you get off scot free. So, nice. Little hand for you there. Especially <laughs> if you're writing crime fiction, useful. Uh, I've you got told me that years ago. I've got I've got a, a customized or maybe a modified rifle in that novella now. Uh, yeah. Because of that, <laughs> I've thrown it in there. <laughs> um, well, uh, I did say this was a slightly unusual episode in uh, the structure. And uh, Tarek, I'm going to ask you now for your writing oh, highlights. Oh, you weren't even highlight. prepared for this. I Jesus Christ! Okay, uh, I think for me, um, 
going to Harrogate this year was for the first time uh, was pretty awesome. Um, I really enjoyed that. I, I, I wasn't on a pan or anything; just kind of went down Harrogate and, just for people. So, of course, yeah. It's a, so it's a writing festival, and it's it's one of the biggest writing festivals in the UK, and it runs over a weekend in June or July, and um, and you get loads of big names there, and it's really cool big massive tent and just like you know you could be standing having a drink at the bar and you know lee child walks past and richard osmond's there etc so they're all the big names and the kind of it's a crime writing festival so all the big crime authors are there and they mingle with everyone and it's a really good way to kind of network etc and all that kind of crap but so i kind of went so i went down for the first time uh, just to kind of basically hang around with the same two people who were there unfortunately <laughs> so i leached onto them for the entire weekend i didn't know anyone else and um and yeah, and it was it was really good actually meeting people. And I kind of the highlight for me of that weekend was I'm a big Essie Cosby fan. I love his stuff. I love his style. Was uh, he kind of all the sinners bleed? Is his newest one. And um, I've read an essay Cosby, and I'm trying to remember which essay Cosby I Blacked Up Wasteland. That was Blacked great. Up Wasteland is probably and Razor Blade Tears is also excellent. So those are his two books that. He'd, that it kind of it came big with and then all of a sudden his bleed is his new one came out this year and they're, they're all fantastic and um and i got to meet him and i could chat to him for like 10 minutes and he came over and sat at our table and he was like a super nice guy really down to earth just like you know came from nothing and in the last in you know the last few years he's like gone from like a trailer in america and now he's like super multi-millionaire like it's just a it's the kind of like the dream story i think a lot of writers think of that kind of rags to riches almost and massive exposure and he's like on he was telling us he's on like a zoom call with matthew mcconaughey he's going to play a part in his film and, you know it's just it was like i was like shit that is like the really cool journey that i would love to go and he's like a really nice guy and his books are brilliant so yeah that was that was kind of a starstruck moment for me that that at that point that was that was really cool cool I, but has, have any of you had starstruck moments in terms of meeting you know, through your writing, being able to meet some of the authors that you've admired. Several, yeah, several. I uh, I met Matt Karen briefly, uh, who's a I'm a huge Matt Karen fan, um, and uh, I met Charles Cumming as well. He's another spy author, um, and Adrian Tchaikovsky was I was he at Chimera this year or last year? I can't last remember. Year, Ch- I think it was. Last year, yeah. Um, Chimera is the Edinburgh science fiction fantasy and horror festival um in may june the end of may beginning of june time um and that's been i've got to meet some incredible authors uh, i also got to meet stark holborn who uh is one of the writers i've got one of her books here for later on uh when we're talking about books but um i when i was kind of just getting back into writing and kind of in a bit of a slump i read um I read the book Ten Low, which was the first book in her, in the Factus trilogy that she wrote, and it's kind of space western. Uh, it's like Mad Max meets Wait, Firefly. Oh, it's a fantastic book, awesome. and and it was one of those books that where I picked it up and I didn't, I I you know I was looking at the cover, I was like, okay, this looks cool, and then from the first page, I was like, this is just just incredible, and I got to meet her first at Fantasy in the Court, which is like um, Goldsboro Books does, does a fantasy and science fiction event in London. I got to meet her there. And I also got to meet her at Chimera this year. And it was great just to meet her. And, and I got to tell her, like, your book kind of got me out of a, a writing slump. And it was fantastic. And um, that she's just started writing the third one. So I'm hopeful that will come out in, in a year or so. But Excellent. fantastic books. Highly recommend them. What about nice. you, Nick? Uh, I've had a couple. It was it was I, it was really cool um, at um, Camera earlier this year. I was on a panel with Christopher Priest, who is uh, obviously you know just an absolute heavyweight in the SF world. Uh, and I've read a, a few of his books, and I and I've really enjoyed them. Uh, and obviously, you've got things like The Prestige that were made into a film, and which is one of my favorite films of all time. And and not just meeting him, but actually being on a panel with him um, uh, was a it was a special moment. Um, I think there's the obvious, I, I haven't met him, I haven't actually conversed with him, but there was the obvious freak out moment this year when uh, I opened up Twitter and Stephen King was saying that he loved my book. And I was like, that's, okay, that's that's something. <laughs> like, um, but in terms of, uh, in terms of meeting 
oh God. Well, in terms of be- meeting writers and idols that I really look up to, there was also one very recently, but I'm not allowed to talk about it uh, mm-hmm. with you guys, uh, partly because it was a bit more of a business meeting than it was a casual meeting. Uh, but maybe one day I can relay that that chat to you. But that was also a very special moment for me. Exciting. Nice. Exciting. Was that when we chatted just before we came on the air? <laughs> that was that was it, Tarek. That was the one. <laughs> we're not. We said we weren't going to talk to other people. Sorry, about sorry. It. We met Marco sorry. Jealous. Yeah. Um... <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, since no one's asking me, I'm going to tell you my right now. I, I was, I was uh, thanks, again Tarek. just about to ask. Don't worry. No, it's all right. It's fine. <laughs> so, Marco, what's your highlight of the year? Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'm too um, used to be you being the leader, Marco. And don't, na- uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> I don't know what to do when you're not taking control. Nice, nice of you to ask. Um, <laughs> yeah, obviously, my highlight has to be uh, I, at the last minute, decided to enter um, Bloody Scotland's Pitch Perfect competition, uh, where you had to write a hundred words pitch for a crime novel, and. Um, I yeah literally last minute and I thought well why not I'll do it because I'd had this story that I'd started writing it had been a story that I've always wanted to write and I hadn't ever got around to sort of seriously doing it but I thought I'll do the pitch because I I know the concept of the story Uh, and I was selected in the final of that there were eight eight or nine of us I think in the final and um that was out of a pretty big pretty big short yeah it was, yeah. It was 90 so, people wasn't there yeah so yeah. The, there was a reasonable amount of people entered and then so that meant at bloody scotland i had to stand up and uh deliver my pitch a two-minute pitch uh of the book to a live audience include and the sort of panel was, including us we including were, we were you yeah, yeah. Watching, yeah. Didn't it? Uh, yeah. Were there. exactly <laughs> um but uh and it left already uh, i don't know uh, <laughs> <laughs> nick was like i'm definitely not it's, Waste of time watching that, and Ollie Munson was uh, on the panel, and uh, a couple of editors as well. And yeah, it it was it was uh, you know a great experience. Uh, I didn't win that, but immediately after it, um, an agent came up to me, gave me her card, um, Francesca Riccardi uh, uh, at Kate Nash, and sort of said, uh, "Really liked your pitch. Um, Get in touch." And I was sort of like, "Well, you know, I haven't because I'd said in the pitch, I haven't." you know i've only written a few thousand words um and she said no that's fine send me it send me it so i did so without much too much expectation i thought maybe she might be interested once it was finished but uh she then asked me for a synopsis which i didn't have so i had to quickly write a synopsis as well <laughs> um but I, uh, the end result of that was that she uh, offered to made an offer to represent which was amazing uh, you know this is something i've been searching for for ages um, she was really enthusiastic about about the book, about the story. So yeah, so that's been my highlight. And now I have just since that day, I have basically been uh, writing, trying to write this book. So I'm forty five thousand words in. So uh, yeah, we're definitely getting there, and I'm hoping to finish it early next year, <clears throat> and then we'll see we'll see what happens from then. But yeah, definitely definitely a highlight there. And it's great because it's you know, another, you know, we've chatted to so many folk with the podcast who found agents in hundred different ways, and it's just another example of. It's, you don't have to do the standard sending in yeah. an ex- yeah. extract, you know, and and then uh, submission, query letter, etc. There's like a billion ways you can get in touch and get in front of an agent. And yeah. and uh, Although, even as you said, like a pitch thing, you're like, oh, I don't know if I can be arsed with this. Like, is it, what's there much point to it? But the total there is. Yeah. You never yeah. Know who's the audience. Yeah. Drop at the door, you know. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. That was the <laughs> <same. laughs> <That's laughs> Yeah. I was going to say the the standard the standard routes do exist in our you know I got my agent through the standard route of querying. However, I was going to say these things do happen in the background, like the the book that I sold in the summer. Um, I sold after I'd written two other books. I wrote the book that I got rep with that didn't sell. Then and and a lot of people don't really talk about the fact that sometimes books die on submission. You can write a whole book and it just. Just goes out to general indifference. Um, I wrote another one that also died on submission. I'm, we're kind of keeping these in the back pocket. We might bring yeah. them back at some point. But then the third, the third book happened because the editor, who has now bought the book, came back to us and said, uh, "Can't buy, can't buy these two books for various commercial, boring commercial reasons." But um, what else have you got? You got any ideas? You got any other finished books? And I was like. Well, here's some pitches. I wrote a, synop- uh, wrote a synopsis, wrote a, a sample, 
and then uh he was like cool write me a bit more and we we went back and forth over two or three months and i wrote about uh in the end about forty thousand words and and then at that point we got we got a contract and that's very common for established authors to to sell on a on a pitch and a, and a sample but it's less common for for yeah. debuts but effectively he'd already very seen two books debut. from me so i mean it's yeah. amazing that he he obviously you know spent that time with you go back and forth on a deb- I used to say a debut untested author for, yeah. for an editor I think it's also, publisher to spend that time is amazing it also yeah. says so much about about I think the market when people are like you know there's there's always so many questions out there about kind of why why a book is picked up and why a book is is um you know bought and all of these sorts of things and I thought it was so interesting to have an editor who for both of those two books that you submitted to both times he was like look you are clearly an extremely talented writer. I would love to work with you. The books are great, but they are not right for my list right now. You know, yeah. and I think that yeah. that in that difference, you can really impress an editor, and they can love your book. But if it doesn't fit the marketing necessities that their list needs at that particular time, then they're not going to be able to acquire it. And um, and I thought that was really interesting. And the fact, but the fact that he stuck with you and went, God, these are you're clearly a very very talented writer so maybe you can write something that does fit the market it says these yeah yeah you know? and, um, and it was it was it was that sort of rapid fire back and forth um you know and we had a couple of zoom calls and and ultimately i still wrote a book that i wanted to write the idea was one that i came up with you know um and if he had said actually no i don't want any of these pitches i would have probably written one of them anyway and probably this one and we probably would have gone out out on wide submission with it again um but i yeah I'm, I'm super glad he kind of demonstrated that enthusiasm early on and was like want to work with you you know you, you can obviously write quickly because you sent me two books in less than a year and a half um, so maybe we can do something here and yeah thankfully it's, it's turned into a, a finished book that I am just working on uh, edits for at the moment in fact yeah I mean actually I, that sort of touches on on a, another question that I had and it's one that we've discussed off off podcast as well before but I thought it'd be an interesting thing to discuss on podcast with... space Marco <laughs> that's my favorite one <laughs> we'll get to that Tarek we'll get to that um uh, is your your first book was a, a more speculative the, the one that got you the agent was a more speculative yeah. book and just generally speaking it seems to me that there you know and we've spoken to other guests on the podcast about this as well but you know it seems that selling that sort of spec fiction is a much harder deal than say a straight thriller or a straight crime novel or something like that and I've always found it slightly odd given when you look at the when you step back from books and look at entertainment as a whole um speculative stuff does amazingly well it's probably the biggest stuff in the entertainment industry if you're counting sort of superhero movies uh, star wars even on computer games things like skyrim all the, you know so it's not that people aren't aren't wanting that type of stuff or maybe it is just that the other entertainment is consumed by a very specific market i don't know what what, what do you guys think I think um, I remember. I remember very vividly. I went to see uh, Ian Banks, uh, who, I, who I miss greatly. He's one of my favorite authors. Um, but I went to see him do a reading from one of his books, and there was a Q and A afterwards. And someone in that Q and A kind of basically, not so subtly, suggested that you know he was he was doing the sci fi for the money. You know, they were they were like, oh yeah, obviously that's where you make your money. And he was like, no, 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 it's the other way around. Like the literary fiction stuff outsells my sci-fi 10 to 1, like easily. And I think I think the 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 kind of uh, when you're in the sci-fi speculative fiction world and that's your main focus, you, you kind of look at it and you think, yeah, this is a huge market it's like, but it's not it's really tiny especially relative to crime thriller and just general fiction they're just so much bigger and i think as a result there's much fewer there's fewer imprints there's fewer editors there's fewer slots in the in the lists and the publishing so that and the competition there's a lot of people writing this stuff as well mm-hmm. so the competition for those slots is much more intense and i think that as a result you need to have something really special to get one one of those one of those slots. And I'm not saying that you don't need to have something special for other genres, not at all. But I think that there are more opportunities, you know. And as a result, um, you can um, 
potentially hit more editors and get more opportunities to kind of get it in front of people who might be able to buy it. Um, and then there's just there's so many more imprints with so many different business models and so much, much bigger lists as well. So I also think um, that I think that speculative stories in film and TV that are really popular don't quite match up to speculative fic adult speculative fiction in books in the same kind of way. Because I think adult speculative fiction, particularly sci-fi, but fantasy as well in, in, in many ways has a tendency to be really quite cerebral, quite esoteric, quite out there, um, quite pushing the boundaries in many, many ways, um, in the way that really popular speculative films, and I'm thinking of your Star Wars, your Marvel, your, your, the, you know, the, the big, big blockbusters, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Or the Rings. Uh, right? Um, they're, they're, they're popcorn films. They're not, you know, they're not groundbreaking ideas necessarily, right? And the, the films that do have really groundbreaking and thoughtful ideas they're not big blockbusters they don't do as well okay but when you think of when you think of the corollary in the book world that's kind of it's more your a lot of your ya literature i suppose where in that space actually the speculative stuff is the most popular think of the biggest mm -hmm. ya books of the past 15 20 years they're all speculative, games right yeah. Hunger Games, Harry Potter, like any anything like that. They're yeah. all there. You're not getting, you get very few contemporary realist YA books that break out as big as the speculative ones. And I think almost like that's the parallel to your, your Marvel and your Star Wars to some degree in the film world, rather than your, your Ian M. Banks, rather than your, your kind of uh, Arcadie Martin, you're kind of, you're really pushing the boundaries, mm -hmm. kind of really cerebral and interesting spec fic. I also yeah. wonder if you get more interesting spec um, film uh, film stuff in the TV world as opposed to the film world yeah. because you, like I'm thinking of stuff like Severance or like Silo or Foundation Silo or whatever you know that uh, Silo is a bit to be so is Foundation to be fair maybe they're bad examples but like Severance is like a for anyone who's not, who's not seen it as a kind of a concept of like your work life balance is literally severed and so when you go to work you you don't remember your home life and vice versa and it is one of the best TV shows I saw every year was it came out. Um and it's it's super speculative and super sci-fi wide crazy concept. Um and I don't know if you if that would have been made into a film or not. If it, I, it seems like a kind of film that I would imagine would be a kind of like indie movie, low budget, yeah. maybe it would be massive, but on a TV show it was maybe given a chance to breathe and although just... like I suppose there are but I suppose there's exceptions to everything, but something like Interstellar Arrival, things like that, where big Big, big names get involved as well to help hits yeah the cinema right. as well. uh, everything right. everywhere all at once is obviously yeah. the, the the other yeah exactly yeah. Thing too. you know that cleaned up at the oscars like um and that's very bonkers pushing the boundaries spec work in so many different ways um well i mean we we have uh talked around um this stuff but because it's a sort of end of year thing i did also want to um ask you a bit about the sort of you know everyone puts out things with lists and things like that but i did want to ask what your sort of books of the year were um this year so the the, the best books you've read it doesn't need to be necessarily a book that was published this year just books that you've read this year that that, that you really enjoyed um i don't know let's start with dave Sure. Um, I, I knew this question was coming because normally when people ask me this, I just go completely blank. Like my, I yeah, hate my that. I know books, yeah. books, what are books? Um, so I made a little stack and I'm nice. going to go through them quite quickly. Oh, nice. nice. Go through them quickly. So, and there's a bit of it. It's better. You can see these on variety. YouTube, our YouTube channel. I'll say yeah. it again. <laughs> In fact, I might just quickly, uh, yeah, well, I will say the names. I'm not just going to sort of slide show them up, but I will, I will, um, uh, turn off my virtual background so that, uh, Hang on, was that fake? Really oh, yeah. <laughs> did, did you not realize? <laughs> All right. um, so this book is oh, yeah. uh, The Fall of Coley right. by M.R. Carey, Mike Carey, who I think has been on the show twice. Twice, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, this is the third in the Ramparts trilogy, and it's uh, kind of, I describe it when I'm talking to people about it as an accessible Ridley Walker, which relies on you knowing what Ridley Walker is, which is a book from the 80s by a guy called Russell Hoban, about uh, written in... Um, but essentially, a, a like uh, a de I wouldn't say devolved, but an evolved form of English. So a, a, after a nuclear war, um, and it's, it's almost phonetic, and the whole and once you get your head around it, it's like the phonetics in 
train spotting or whatever. You, you, once mm-hmm. you've got an ear, once you got your eye in, you can read it. But that's essentially quite a, I think, quite a conventional story, but told in this interesting way with this new version of English. Whereas this is written in pretty much standard English, but it has a lot of the same vibes, um, and it's a brilliant story. And it has a whole bunch. There's a there's an insane Japanese AI in it called Maneki Maneki Neko, I think, um, who ends up basically befriending a boy in post-apocalyptic England and the the rest of the story kind of falls out of that starting point. The fact they're great books. I really enjoyed them. Yeah, I've read um, them. They are brilliant. Yeah. Uh, and then on the other end of the spectrum is a couple of spy thrillers. So uh, this is Damascus Station uh, by David McCloskey, who's a kind of square-jawed, square-jawed ex-CIA man um, who happens to also be an excellent writer, which is like, seems unfair, but here um and it's fantastic it's, it's really good um kind of uh story set in the syrian revolution in 2011 2012 uh and it's as far as i know fictional um but it's a very it's his debut and it's like annoyingly good in terms of how well paced it is and the, there's a character in this called artemis proctor who is the cia station chief in syria uh mm-hmm. who's probably I mean, the, the, my f- i think with these books thrillers they always come up with such weird names but i know names that i know are so brilliant totally for right. that yeah. type of yeah thing, you know? and, and and the thing is you can't imagine that character with any other name yeah and yeah. there's a scene at the end of the book which is simultaneously one of the most banana things i've read in the last five years but which was absolutely perfect for that character and and i i've heard since that she's going to be a, a fairly major character in the in the next two novels that he's right. he, the next one comes out in like two weeks time in the uk and he's got a third one on, on the on the boil which is apparently a retelling of tinker taylor soldier spy but in this in the cia which sounds amazing oh, to cool. me that's interesting uh this is mccarran real tigers which is the one that's currently airing on apple tv and slow horses this this is the one that they made into season three of uh of I, i'm like one book ahead of the tv show i'm trying to kind of read read them before it's really interesting the changes they've made in the tv show but this is a very good one with your kind of standard shadowy figure yep I like cover um this is hell's eight this is the sequel to ten low uh, by stark holborn um more like dusty space cowboy but it's but it, it's a it's a heavily uh mostly female cast uh but also like a really interesting backstory there's a 13 year old um genetically altered gen like special forces general who's been a ch- child soldier essentially who's escaped to this planet he's uh plays a much bigger role in this book um they're fantastic books can't recommend them enough really uh all right three more three more uh this is the actual star by monica byrne which is um three stories that essentially take place in the same place but a, um, a thousand years apart so the first story takes place in 1012 the middle story takes place in 2012 and the third story takes place in basically po- post climate change ravaged earth in 3012 um and i can't really describe it it's just it's a very it's, i read this on holiday it's an absolute brick of a book um and it just blew my mind it was fantastic so nice recommend that uh i'm reading this which is strange the dreamer by yeah. laney taylor uh which nick recommended to me for about a year before i got around to it but basically because he recommended me a book and i really didn't enjoy it and then after that i was like <laughs> i don't trust you man but then i got this one what and was, I, wait, I, I, no i'm not gonna i'm not gonna say the one that i didn't enjoy that's that's not kind and then finally for welcome the writers, to cooper by uh, tara cash <laughs> yeah <laughs> you son of a bitch and then <laughs> the third one this is um the organized writer which is by anthony johnson um not the singer um who i met actually at bloody scotland a really nice guy and he's like a comics writer he's the guy that wrote yeah. uh, atomic blonde and um, oh, a couple of course, other things yeah. he's, he's now writing cozy crime the the dog sitter detective which is like a fantastic sort of second career act i'm, I'm loving it but this is his book and he used to be like an advertising copywriter and he's basically created this organizational system for working writers that's based on traffic systems and advertising agencies. And it might some bits of it might be overkill for some writers, but the idea of like how you organize your work and how you organize things and the idea that it doesn't have to be chaos and you can organize things in a way that makes it easier for you to actually do the creative work is um it's pretty cool. It's a great I, t- book. I take it he's got a chapter in there on the using page one in the writer's notebook 
Um, I think this book may predate your notebook. Oh, okay. but, uh, I'll be in the second yeah, edition. Sorry to say. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure it'll be in the second edition. <laughs> sure uh, what what about me. you, Nick? Um, I, I, I'm not prepared enough to have a, a, a litany of books to, to wave in front of your face, um, unfortunately. <laughs> but, but I've read a ton of books this year and a ton of fantastic books. So actually whittling it down to, to, to just a few... Um, was difficult, but I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start with ones that that were actually released this year. Um, that I think that that were really special for me. Um, uh, I read I read Titanium Noir by Nick Harkaway at the beginning of the year, which I thought was fantastic. Um, for anyone, Harkaway is such an interesting writer, uh, and I've read more Harkaway since and before, and he's he's got this ability, which is really interesting because now he's for those who don't know who Nick Harkaway is, he's a He's kind of a spec fic writer who's who's done some straight crime, crime stuff yeah. under a pseudonym. Uh, but he's also John, John Le Carre's son um, as well. And he's actually now taking on the mantle of writing a John Le Carre book yeah, um, so uh, coming up next, which is really interesting because he's, in my mind, he is such a different writer to his dad. They're both fantastic, right? But they're both very, very different. So I'm going to be really interested to see how that goes. And he's a writer who all his works are so fundamentally different. Like they're in different genres, they do different things. And yet there's this, there's something so Harkaway about all of them. You know, there's something that, that that brings them all together. And Titanium Noir is, usually his books are big, big chunks, you know, some some like no more are absolutely yeah. huge. and But most of them are, are pretty hefty, right? And Titanium Noir is this short little novella, really. Um, that's, there's very much this pastiche of a kind of noir detective, um, book but in a futuristic sci-fi world with these giant titans and all sorts of crazy stuff going on and it's just absolutely engaging from start to end like some wonderful very harkaway ridiculous scenes that like as i'm reading them i think another a lesser writer could not pull off this scene like it would just if a, if another writer tried to do it it would be silly but you've somehow made it cool um which always impresses me and so i really really enjoyed titanium noir um the big chunk one that i loved this year which i recommended to you marco and you yeah. have read is um james islington's the will of the many um which is a wonderful fantasy book and I'm, I'm very picky about fantasy these days um i I always try and pick up more fantasy books as I read loads of fantasy when I was a kid. And I'm going to be completely honest to say I put down more than I finish. Um, I, I I DNF more than 50% of fantasy books that I pick up. And so it takes something that's doing something. I would say that's doing something quite different or just doing something really well to get me through. And the, mm -hmm. the funny thing about The Will of the Many, and we chatted about this, Marco, yeah. is it's not until the end. It does some really funky yeah. structural stuff at the end, which I fell in love with. But like for the first 75% of the book, it's not doing anything different. No, it's, it, it's like every, tro if you were to sit down and list every trope that you yeah. could from classic fantasy fiction, it would have it. He just does them all so fucking well. Like yeah. they're just, they're just I, I agree. I mean, perfect. It's, it's, yeah, it's got everything. It's got like secret prince uh, hiding away. and <laughs> It's got a magic school. magic school. It's got like, uh, yeah. it's got all of the like. It's, yeah. It is, it's, it's got all the tropes, but the tropes exist for a reason. People like them if they're yeah. done well. And I would say, I agree with you. The Will of the Many is one of my books as well, because um, it is just a brilliant book. Because just, within, because he doesn't, he doesn't rely on the tropes. I think that's no, the key, I think right? That's right yeah. Because the tropes, the tropes are there because they're fun. But what really is compelling about the book is the complexity of the characterization. You know, um, the the power of the prose, the the pacing, the, the all of that. That it's the book is just very very accomplished, um, and that's what makes the book so good. And the tropes, when you recognize them, you're just like, this is this is also just really fun, right? Um, and it was it was it was probably the most fun I have had with the book yeah. all year, definitely um so the one of the many for sure uh other books that published this year um another one it's another fantasy book that i didn't put down uh which was uh richard swan's the tyranny of faith i love the justice of kings tyranny of faith was even better um i actually got an arc that richard sent me of um the the third book on my kindle which is my christmas reading um which i'm very much looking forward to but that was fantastic 
Um, strong recommend there. Um, and then um, that was all, that's that's all SFF stuff. But um, in the kind of literary fiction world, um, Caleb Azuma Nelson released Small Worlds this year, which I loved. Um, if you've not read him, he, he kind of came up big a year or two ago with Open Water. They're, they're kind of they're small, quite character driven novellas mm -hmm. about him I, they're not about him they're not they're not autobiographical but but they almost might as well be when you read them they're they're about kind of characters with english Ghanaian heritage uh kind of existing in 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 the uk and in london and relationships and and what that means for them and and he's just got a way with prose that's utterly beautiful and i get completely enraptured by it and i thought small worlds were better than open water i thought small worlds was fantastic i really loved it um and then I'm going to call out two more books that I that did not come out this year, but I read this year and I loved. I finally read Arcade Martin's A Desolation Called Peace after having read so um, the first book, A Memory Called Empire, a couple of years ago. And it's just been meaning to get to it and never did for ages. And I'm just like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit down and do it because I love The Memory Called Empire. And A Desolation Called Peace is even better. It's, you know, one of those rare ones where the sequel just steps everything up from the from the first and it's, I just can't recommend enough. But I almost don't want to ruin anything about it by talking about it because there are some concepts in that book that are just yeah, so I, clever. Like, I was about, I was about to spoil one, but I won't know you. So you just reading but, it for the yeah. first time, the just yeah. and seeing it play out is, as you, you know, you know, books where you sit there, particularly as a writer, sometimes and you just go like, "Oh man, like that." Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. That. I, couldn't, I, that. That. I couldn't even think of that. Like that's amazing. Yeah. There was a scene in that book that I appreciated on about four different levels because I was like, technically, this is one of the best things I've read in the last five years. And then I was like, art, like artistically and in terms of the emotion that it's eliciting and, and just how effective it is as a narrative, it's hitting me there as well. As a writer, I'm just like, holy shit, how did she even do this? Um, but yeah, it, it's some of the most lyrical speculative writing I've read in since i don't know god knows since actually like kayla gwen i would say like it's 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 a great book I so it. yeah no fantastic absolutely brilliant and then the other one was um that, that stuck out to me was burnt shadows by kamala shamsi which is it, it's not even close to being published recently she published it years ago but I, I i like kamala shamsi a lot she's a she's a again a literary fiction writer who writes about all sorts of different things um i got into her through reading her book home fire which was wonderful um and burnt shadows is basically it's about god it's about a lot of things but it's about essentially the fallout of the bombing of nagasaki um and how that impacts world events all the way to the the breakup of india and pakistan um and kind of um things happening in the us and, and how it impacts kind of characters all across the globe it's one of those kind of big generational novels where yeah. you kind of after a few chapters, you then jump forward about 20 years and you you see their sons and their daughters and things like that. And it's wonderfully written. It's just, it's one of those books where you really connect with the characters. You feel, you live with them. Like you feel like they've become real people in their own right. And I think Kamali Shamsi has a real powerful way of doing that. Um, I, I cried twice in that book. I'm going to say that's a high accolade, but it's not because I'm a book crier. And, uh, you know, me saying that I cried in a book just means that, you know, there was, was some the emotion in it somewhere, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, um, so, uh, so that doesn't say much, but, uh, but it was, it, it's a beautiful book. Um, and, and yeah, I loved it, but that, that came out ages ago. But I would say those are my top, when I was thinking about my top books I've read this year, those are my top. Cool. I'm going to make a confession. I was looking up the name of an author for my book and I missed the name of your second last book that you said. It was Desolation, that a, Desolation. A Desolation Called Peace. Yeah. Yeah. Peace. That's, that's, yeah. Uh, that's very cool. Um, Marco, what was your uh, Yeah, so of the, year? Um, the Will of the Many, as Nick said, uh, he's book. already talked about it, but I agree it was, it was just... I mean, I, I have got into fantasy books again over the past few years um Liza Lamora 
one of my favourite books actually, which I just got a special edition of. Okay, if I can. Oh, you went for it. Nice. Oh, that is signed, nice. Signed by is it orange, Lynch himself. Orange ends. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. that's yeah. Oh, little spreadsheets. Spreadsheets. Yeah. Um, uh, which I just think is a fantastic book. Um, that kind of got me back into reading fantasy again. And I, I agree, there's definitely ups and downs, but The Will of the Many was um, really great fun to read. I think that was the most, you know, that's what, when I read fantasy, often that is what I want, want out of it. And it, it really pulled you in. But the characters also, you really cared about them. So I'm already looking forward to the second book, particularly with what happens at the end. But no spoilers, but it is... A, mad ending um but it's one of the, like when you say about it being fun it's just one of those books that like you know the book where you have moments in the book where you literally like punch the air with your fist yeah. in excitement like you're like yes yes, yes exactly. <laughs> yeah it's one of those books and it's just fantastic um other ones uh, there was some book called ascension by some guy i don't know uh, binge or something <laughs> i'm not sure about that one oh but, shit uh, <laughs> um uh, i read uh, the water knife by Paolo Bacigalupi, which um, I loved as well. Uh, if you've not read that, it's... Um, uh, I, I want to say cyberpunk, that. but that's not right. It's probably... No, it's, got, it's, it's kind of climate fiction. It was one of those books that I read where I was altered, I was oscillating wildly between this is a fantastic book, a really well put together book, but it's absolutely terrifying and kind of depressing. And I was kind of like, loving it and hating it simultaneously because it was like just too real in terms of the extrapolations of kind of because it's all about water rights it's all about you know the the various watersheds of the us and how those might lead to future water wars and mm. it's yeah it's terrifying but to told as a told as a very taut thriller as well so exactly yeah it's yeah. definitely a page turner but yeah it, it really well written so i really enjoyed that um uh Tarek had been telling me for ages to read Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir, um, and I did, and I loved it. It was brilliant. Well, actually, I, I say read. I listened to the audiobook. I can't read yes. reading. The audio, um, the guy, audiobook's the, great, yeah. The narrator's amazing. Ray Porter's the yeah, narrator, Ray Porter and he really, brilliant. really sold it. And um, it's a funny book because I felt for the first third of it or something, it was just The Martian again. Yeah. And then yeah. suddenly something <laughs> yeah. happens. I'm going to solve problems with science. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. then something happens, which I'm not going to uh, say what it is. I'm not even going to hint at what it is because it's it's a good reveal. But um, that changes the the concept of the story entirely, and it still has the I'm going to solve problems with science thing throughout yeah, the whole book. A lot, <laughs> but it, it's written in such a great voice, and it you know you really care for the character, and you you, you want to find out what's going to happen. So I really enjoyed that one. It's a really um, fun. Book. Um, uh, the most recently, uh, the book that I just finished actually, which I did really enjoy, is a book called Fourteen by Peter Kleins, which is um, it, it, it's a sort of House of Leaves idea in the sense that a man moves into an apartment building and him and the other residents start to find out that there's lots of weird shit happening, um, except that it's more told in the style of a sort of techno thriller type idea so it's not got the structural stuff of, of house of leaves or anything like that um but uh, the more the more they discover it, it's got quite a breezy tone it's quite a fun book and then it the, it goes quite crazy towards the end it's very it becomes quite lovecraftian and stuff like that so how crazy well, does it go towards the awesome. end because i've i've read one other peter klein which is which was the fold which i really enjoyed for the first 80%. And this is, and keep in mind, this is me saying this mm -hmm. as a, as a, as an author and, a, and, a, and an enjoyer of that kind of story. It jumped to way too many sharks in the last 20% for me. Like it, it just went, <laughs> it just it took a story and it just went off in a direction. I was just like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> this is, this well, is insane. I, like um, I have to say, I could see the same, uh, same charge being leveled against 14 as well but i yeah. kind of I, the reason i found 14 was i was like what is the modern what modern sort of cthulian lovecraftian type stories are there and this was one that lots of people had recommended so i kind of had some idea uh, that it was going to turn like that um and it certainly does turn in quite a big yeah. way towards the end um but i enjoyed it it was a very easy read uh told the as i say sort of very um 
Yeah, he's a very pacey writer. Like, yeah. He's a very page turner yeah, like, exactly. uh, yeah. So yeah. I, I enjoyed that one uh, as well. So um, I'm just looking at, um, you, you know, I should have had this all prepared, but I don't. Oh, yeah, the, the other one was um, uh, The Children of Gods and Fighting Men by Sean mm, Lawless, who uh, you mentioned yeah. earlier oh, as well. I absolutely great, loved that. I've not read the second book yet, um, but I'm definitely going to. Also fantastic. I've really, had the privilege really of being in the critique group of reading the third book already, which is not even out yet. And Same. I'm just going to I'm just gonna put it out there and say that each one is better than the last. The third book is absolutely amazing. Like, she steps it up every single time. Oh, nice. Um, third book is my favorite of the three. Easy. Excellent. I look forward can I, to it. Can I barge in with one last recommendation? I forgot yeah. about it. Um um, so uh, audiobook particularly so I was listening to a podcast sorry guys not your podcast uh, I think it was right, hang on. Uh, Dave has left the podcast <laughs> we've lost you Dave that was good. I, th- I think it was writer's routine but it might have been another one called the real writing process they're both All right, great you don't need to um, say the name of the other podcast Go sorry on. sorry anyway um, there's we'll a writer called out. Bethany Bethany Clift uh, who was on and she wrote a book called Last One at the Party um, which I think is the first book I've read that is very obviously like a lockdown novel, like written in lockdown, just full of the the, the fear and the uncertainty of the first year of the pandemic. But it's it's a it's a post apocalyptic novel written in the aftermath of a second pandemic uh, called Six DM, which means six days maximum. Right. which is how long you survive after catching it. And it's got like a 99.9999%. Uh, yeah, it's brutal. But the the book, the audio book is pro- probably one of the best um, audio ad- adaptations. Or it's not really, it's, it's a straight audio book, but the whole the whole book is uh, epistolary. It's, it's supposed to be tape transcripts. Um, and there's kind of background sound effects and there's one there's oh, one sequence where she goes she she puts on a hazmat suit and goes into a hospital that's full of dead bodies and there's thousands of rats in there and it was genuinely i was like i was out on an evening walk and i was like this is terrifying <laughs> it's just incredibly good but the whole book as well is intercuts between her life before the pandemic and then you know and all the things that she was unsatisfied with in that life and then her life after the pandemic and how she kind of gradually comes to terms with who she used to be and who she is now being literally the only person left alive um and it's it's a great book i, I can't recommend it enough what's that one called dave it's called last one at the party by that Bethany Clift. and the audio version sounds yeah audio version is particularly awesome it's really great cool nice. and Tarek, nice. what about you so, uh, what did I read this year that I would recommend? Um, I'm going to start with a real spec book, which um, is called There Is No Antimimetic Division by a, a writer called Quantum, Q-N-T-M. Um, mm-hmm. I presume you pronounce it Quantum. Um, and it's a kind of... It's, I it's have a, it yeah, here. I'm going to read get it while you speak about it. Oh, yes. It's, a, it's quite a thin book. It is absolutely fantastic. It's, it's like the SCP Foundation which I've not really read much of, but it's a kind of wiki collaborative writing project. And it's very much that kind of weird fiction. That's it there, Marcus got it, yeah. It's a very kind of that weird fiction, annihilation type stories. Annihilation is, I guess, quite a fate, quite a you know punch to the charm, became big. But it's that kind of like crazy, horror science fiction, fantasy mashup. And Control, the video game, is very much like a kind of homage to the SCP Foundation, and so I think so. So, so that so this book is um and is set in this universe where the there's like a kind of company or a bureau that like investigates strange occurrences, kind of like the X Files or Fringe or Control, and but the imagination is just amazing. Like the opening story is a which I won't spoil it, but it's almost like kind of many stories that all feed into a bigger narrative and. The opening story is a woman who goes for a job interview and then it turns out that she's actually the boss and there's a monster that eats people's memories in the room with them and it's all everyone's forgetting what's going on and it's it, it's like the way it reveals stuff it's just every time i read a story i was like i cannot believe this this guy's still got this imagination to come up with this more and more and more crazy stuff that was just is it kind of like a collection of shorts then it is yeah so they're all shorts but they all kind of feed into a bigger narrative but they're all kind of like independent little stories and um and pop up in one and then 
come in another story in, in a totally different fashion that is made clear and it's all time jumpy. It's it's it made, one of the great. most imaginatively. And borrow that book from you, Marco. Next time I see you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that sounds that's absolutely brilliant. Like it could not be more up my street. Last doing like a weekend. It's really short. <laughs> I, 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 I you... may well. I've not actually read it yet, so I, but it's, it's quite short. So I will. I, I'm yeah. going to read it over the Christmas holidays. Yeah, so. Have you read Lena by the same author? Uh, no, I've not read any other of his stuff. To, so they have stuff on their website. They have some free to read short fiction, and Lena oh, okay. is um, is one that is uh, it's kind of written as as if it's like essentially a, a Wikipedia article. But it's about M.M. Acevedo, which is the first executable image of a human brain. And it's all about... Oh, you this. sent me this. I've read this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, fant- it's fantastic. Oh, and it's, oh, a, it's the same guy. It's, yeah, yeah same, 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 person. same person. Same person. I don't know their gender, but um, it's, yeah, it's, uh, they're fantastic stories. Um, oh, nice. And they've got, a, they've got a, a bunch of other stuff on their website as well. Oh, I'll have to check that out. Because, yeah, I thought that was absolutely absolute phenomenal. Yeah. Um, Another book I read more kind of literary would be Looking Glass Sound by Katrina Ward. Um, oh, yeah. I'm a big Katrina Ward fan. Um, obviously, she kind of, well, for me, broken with The Last House of Needless Street. And then um, Sundial was a, the, the next one that I read, which I thought was even better. Um, and this one was just mental. Like, it starts off as a kind of, fairly, it seems like a fairly straightforward kind of small coastal town serial killer through the, the kids are kind of telling the story and then it just it keeps pulling back the focus more and more and more and it changes and changes and changes and by the time you get to the end it's like you're, you're actually struggling to keep in your head how all these different like perspectives are fit together it's like it's becomes something completely different by the end and it's it's crazy imaginative i don't know how she came up with it or wrote it or tracked it a type thing but it's yeah, it starts off as one thing, and then it's a masterclass it's, in like nesting narratives inside. Yeah, narratives. right, exactly. Like, and, inside yeah. narratives. like it's just. And, it's, it's and there's one point. There's like four. It's almost like an inception. There's like four different. It's like a story within a story within a story, and you're yeah. kind of keeping track of what is, it's. Yeah, it's not keeping track of what point. like just the timeline of the story, what's going on, but also like where the truth is, like which story yeah. is true, who's lying to you, which are fictional, which have been made up, and they're all yeah. like they it changes every chapter. Like it, yeah, yeah, I thought it was phenomenal. Um, I also read for a straight up crime novel. I would recommend uh, "All the Sinners Bleed" to S. A. Cosby. Right? I mentioned that at the start. Just a really, really good, gritty, like noiry, um, small town crime thriller, which is like I really, I love that ch- that 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 stuff. And that really clicked. And then the last one, which I would recommend, is it came out I think a year or two ago now. Is "Sea of Tranquility" by um, Emily St. John Mandel, which I really loved and. I mean, I'd read Station Eleven, and it's very similar to Station Eleven. That kind of well, it, it sort of establishes the thing about it is it establishes a sort of Mandel verse because it, does, it, yeah. it sort of references right. um, the, Glass the Glass Hotel, Hotel as well. Yeah, uh, and I think even it hints at Station Eleven. Station Eleven, yeah, yeah, that's right. So yeah, um, and it's a kind of it, it's yeah, it's that that was one which I was kind of enjoying, and then it started to get more out there as it went on and I enjoyed it more as it leaned more and more into the kind of science fiction side of it. Um, Have you seen the it? TV That's... adaptation of Station Eleven? No, I've heard it's good though. Oh, it's so good and it's really interesting because it changes quite a lot from the book it? but in very, very interesting ways and okay. it's one of those things that takes the same starting point and ultimately ends up at the same ending point but takes a different route to get there in a really really fascinating way and That's it's cool. structurally much more complicated than the book and um, i loved it it was one of the best tv shows i watched this year oh brilliant right i need to i need to I do need, need to watch it because i was i was kind of i was like oh, i don't need to watch i read the book and then i could find it on any streaming service but maybe i'll just go and hunt it out and just buy it and just give it I think, a watch. Where, where did we find it i think we might have bought it, it actually, was a, I, I, I think, think it was on it. it was on one of the prime add-on channel oh is it that was that what it yeah, yeah yeah i think we bought it on apple tv because it was 15 quid for the series and i knew it was going to be a one-off so I, it wasn't like i was committing to buy five series yeah, or yeah. whatever so I um, well that that that, that uh, Tara, are you done with your books Tara? yeah, yeah you are done i'm, I'm done <laughs> even if you've got more <laughs> um uh, that brings us ni- neatly on to uh, a, segue. a segue, a nice segue to uh, your favourite TV and movies of the year. 
And uh, we're going to start with Tarek. Right. What my favourite TV shows of the year? Uh, three shows which I watched this year, which I loved. And I think they all came out this year as well. Um, Last of Us, mm. which I thought was just amazing. You know, video game, yeah. based on video game, which I, I loved um, for for the reasons which I love the TV show, which is the narrative, the characters, the, the you know the way it's basically like a play, like a movie or type thing. It's and the and the seriousness of it I, I, think, I think the tv show even improved on the narrative oh yeah i, I yeah i agree yeah. with and i was amazed how close it stuck to the yeah. game actually like it didn't use it as a launching off point of view but also very much simultaneously did like you know stuck to the game very 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 closely except for like you get that bottle episode uh, yeah uh, oh god that was that which, was just, just outstanding was some of the best tv i've seen you know, all year like, yeah 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 it's brilliant um highly recommend that cannot wait to see what they do with part two uh, my next show, which I really, really enjoyed, was The Bear, which I think everyone agrees is pretty yeah, much fantastic. You know, a phenomenal TV show. It's, the second season was just as good as the first, if not a bit better. Like the tension is still there. The the see the Christmas episode with the family was just one of the most stressful dinners I've watched <laughs> in a long time. And the you know the cast, the, the big names that pop in for like ten minutes here and there. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, be, absolutely brilliant. Love that show. And it, and it's a show which I. I remember watching, thinking, oh, everyone says it's good, I'll, I'll, I'll watch it. Didn't think I would love it as much as I did. Phenomenal. And well, final show, which that, I that I think is so amazing about the bear, and I'm just taking some time to say this, because the bear was, was going to be on mine anyway, so you, you've stolen one of mine. Uh, <laughs> but, but one of the things I was going to say about it is, and I'm surprised that streaming shows have not done this before, is as we move away from you know scheduled TV that ha- has to happen in a certain time, into streaming shows, right? I'm surprised that more streaming shows haven't done what the Bears done, which has gone. For this episode, we need an hour because that's the story that we want to tell. Right. For this episode, we need half an hour because that's yeah. the story that we want to tell. Like it, totally the timing agree. of the episodes, particularly in season two, shifted all over the yeah. place depending on the story they want to tell. And I was like, well, you're streaming, of course, you can do whatever the fuck you want. Like it totally agree. And I'm surprised that other shows haven't done that in the yeah, past when they, the mindset they of like, this kind of like we must have a show in a certain time frame yeah. like because there's no nothing necessitating you do that if you're not releasing it on cable tv you know exactly yeah no i totally agree yeah it's it, it it's it leans into the strengths of it and it is it's phenomenal um and, and and the last show i'd recommend is beef on netflix which i loved which is a kind of uh, starts off as a road rage incident with two people and then they get, both get caught up in each other's lives and they're just constantly trying to one-up each other and ruin each other's lives and it just builds and builds and builds and builds and it's like it goes crazy places and yeah it's phenomenal it's very 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 good really enjoyed it excellent uh, uh, and uh, Nick uh, so one of my I'll give you three TV shows because I haven't watched that many films this year uh, or new, not new films that have come out this year um but um, three TV shows. One of them was going to be the bear, so um, we talked about that already. But Excellent yeah, phenomenal. Choice. Um, another one which was a comedy, and usually I'm not. Uh, comedies wouldn't usually make the top of my list, um, because I just not that I don't like comedies, but I find dramas usually a little bit more compelling. But um, Colin from Accounts. Has anyone watched Colin from Accounts? Oh, I've heard it's very. Oh, I've heard I've about it. it. Yeah, it's I've not seen it. So funny. Um. It's like, yeah, it's fantastically good, and and actually, like, for a, for a comedy show, it has some some pretty solid emotional heft to it as well. Like, it's engaging. It's just, it's really really good. I kind of, I almost don't want to spoil anything about it. It's by Ennis. It's written and acted in by this Australian couple. It's an Australian show, but it's on it's on BBC iPlayer. I'm pretty sure. I, that, I think we watched it on BBC iPlayer. Um, it's just, it's brilliant. It was really really entertaining um and genuinely like laugh out loud hilarious at many points um so i would i would strongly recommend that um and then the other one which we only got into this year but but has been coming going out for, coming out for a while and the third season just finished this year just came out in 2023 um is warrior um which is um this uh it's, it's a show that they keep i mean one of the things that they put at the beginning of every episode was, was based on the writings of bruce lee supposedly um but i think they've kind of 
they've gone quite far away from that now they've watched the first season yeah. um but the, the concept i think was was initially a show that bruce lee wanted to make um back in the day which is set in set in a 1870s uh california um about chinese immigrants and irish immigrants and kind of the establishment of california and and all of the tensions in between that and it's kind of it's essentially a mix between the best kind of bruce lee style martial arts films that you can imagine with a cowboy western in in that kind of 1870s america uh together with really compelling characters with really interesting storylines and just like obviously with the mix of those two things some really cool action scenes as well at the same time and like just consistently entertaining over three seasons um really really enjoyed it really loved it nice. um and uh yeah i'll jump to me because i think dave's having a uh, connection issues just now yeah so i i should have prepared this more because i can't actually think of very many things that i've watched this year but um i'm gonna say uh I I don't even know if it was this year, but the the boys, uh, oh, I, I yeah, enjoyed it a that. lot. Um, in in a time of superhero fatigue, um, I think that still stands up because it is I so totally irreverent and just sort of flying in the face of the other superhero stuff that's out there just now. So um, I heard the spinoff, the the teen spinoff, is Gen, actually Gen surprisingly Gen good. The, yeah, yeah. Very really. good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah which surprised that. me because it looked it looked dreadful from the from the trailer. I was <laughs> I like, didn't no, watch it because it looked terrible, <laughs> but it's apparently really good. I don't know. Yeah, so no, I'm nice. def- I, I will I will definitely end up watching that one. Um, uh, the the other one uh, next, Last of Us. You've already talked about. Um, loved that, uh, and I'm very very late to the party on this one. But we just watched um, season one of True Detective. Um, which I absolutely loved. Uh, yeah, I loved the it. only thing about it that that slightly disappointed me was at the very very end. I felt it, it didn't drop the ball by any means. It was still good, but I felt it could have leaned in more to the weird stuff and yeah, really, weird enough. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, felt, it felt like it was going down a kind of spec, but yeah, and then it, it's it's not, and that which is fine. But I was kind of like, uh, a person I would have liked it. Yeah, yeah, leaning in more into the weird stuff for sure. Yeah, I, I I read someone, I read a comment probably on Reddit that said it would have been really good if True Detective had each each season of True Detective had these really grounded crime stories, but it would all, that all had some sort of cult around them, and that's kind of what you know. So the 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 weird stuff was a real thing that was going on in the background, kind of a thing. Not necessarily that the characters would find, but it would be in there would be the speculative stuff. Yeah, that that, that there, I, I like the, cool. the, the thought of that a lot. Yeah, um, and the only you know the trouble is I, I generally the only things I can think that I watch is what I watch when I sit down to dinner with the girls. So uh, things modern like family. Modern Family, yeah, which is brilliant. <laughs> I love Modern Family. Modern uh, Family is very cool. So yeah, uh, very quick for me on on that topic. Um, Dave, what about you? I've got a few. Um, I'll start with a film. So uh, The Creator, I um, enjoyed despite itself. It's, it's a it's a funny film. It's, it's Everybody simulti- that I have heard talk about it has said pretty much exactly that. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> it's okay. yeah, yeah. I enjoyed it, but I didn't. It's funny. It's like it's a film that's simultaneously too long um, because there's a bunch of setup that's really slow moving and it only really gets going narratively in the last third and it's also too short um because the the ending feels really rushed and choppy um but it's got some absolutely gorgeous visuals it has that kind of that visual shorthand that i would describe as like scratched paint punk you know lots of sort of real looking robots and real looking yeah depths and stuff like that and and it's yeah it's it's got some fantastic world building and some really interesting stuff it's also got some really dodgy world building that's a bit like mm, i'm not sure that works um but I, I loved it on the big screen um and i think if you have a very large tv it's probably worth um pe- uh, checking out when it when it shows up on streaming um so yeah that was good um on netflix i really enjoyed blue eye samurai recently oh, yeah. um which f- for me was the sort of 2023 um uh, arcane animation that really grabbed me and surprised me in the same way that uh, arcane did a couple of years ago and that 
it kind of massively transcended the pitch. You you read the pit, you know, you read the pitch for Arcane and it was like based based on League of Legends and yeah. you're like, what well, whatever. And then it vastly kind of transcended that that starting point. And Blue Eye Samurai is kind of sim- similar. It kind of reads like a slightly schlocky um um kind of uh, myth- mythic tale set in uh, pre or not uh, Edo period Japan um but it's it's all about a um samurai who is uh, the daughter of one of the four white men in Japan at, at that period when it was a very very heavily constrained access for foreigners um and she's tracking down those four men and killing them one one after the other but it's also there's also like military coups and um just uh, season two just got renewed and it's fantastic so i highly recommend that and um, just some of the most stunning visuals amazing characters it's great it's great um really enjoy slow horses obviously because i love the books and i think the tv adaptation is probably one of the best castings set of castings that i've ever done to, ever seen to the point that like the the actors from the tv show are fully taken over from the characters in my head when i'm reading yeah. the books in a good way like i'm i don't feel bad about it um andor i loved oh yeah oh, my god oh, i love that's andor. good that yeah. should be my, what's that, that this year i don't know that this I, year? Know this. I, think it was, I think it was this year early it was like, maybe early this year maybe i thought late. andor was one of those shows that i was watching it i was like i'm i almost think i would like this more if it wasn't set in yeah. the star wars universe like yeah. it was and, and and i think one of the really interesting things about it as a show is that it's i think one of the first kind of disney star wars shows that's written by a single writer instead of a writer yeah. show. and that to me showed in the quality of the dialogue and some of the just incredible writing there's there's a couple of scenes in the early episodes where characters de- de- deliver these soliloquies or, or yeah. just little pieces to each other that just absolutely they're just bangers they're just i was gonna say the thing that the thing that really separated Andor for me as there were so many things that were so good about it but it's been a very long time because because I think a lot of modern writers feel like it's I don't know it's it's schlocky or it's it's melodramatic or anything like that. It's been a very long time since I've seen a writer commit to the power of the dramatic monologue in the way that they, they didn't handle. Like there were about seven or eight across the the season dramatic monologues that are just amazing and memorable. Yeah. Um and and I I love that about it. It was it was yeah. felt very um almost Shakespearean show because mm-hmm. of that, you know, like yeah. a kind of a weight. Yeah. And the pacing of it, like they would they like but back, deliberate, like, very it, deliberate it happens. Like, well, I liked it. I liked it. Quicker it was than you think each, it will. Each, each batch of three episodes was its own mini arc. Kind mm-hmm. of thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the that prison worked, stuff yeah. was just yeah. insane. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was at great. the other end of the, yeah. Oh yeah. The, the one way out speech by Andy Serkis is probably the high point of the, yeah. of the entire another season. amazing monologue. Yeah. yeah. Um, at the other end of the scale uh, is the utter daftness of The Diplomat on Netflix, which is a uh, hard to describe, but it's, it's basically what if uh, a bunch of ambassadors were a bit nuts and were doing a bunch of crazy stuff behind the scenes, and it's got... Um, Sounds like real life. I wonder, was that yeah. with Rufus Sewell as, as the... Yes. Yeah, yeah, he was great in it. He was yeah, amazing. And, that was, that was yeah. really fun, actually. That was a great show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lots of snappy dialogue, lots of fun turns um it was just it was an absolute classic like you could see the hooks for the next episode coming a mile off to the point that you were like i know what you're doing here and i know how you're manipulating me but i'm, I'm here for it it's great um i quite liked cyberpunk edge runners um and yeah, that was kind of good, almost yeah. yeah it was like a classic anime but yeah. in the cyberpunk world and having played the game a lot i was like appreciating all the little sound effects and and apparently that did a massive amount to boost sales of the game it kind of had that synergistic effect and people were all over it um there's a show as well on disney plus in the uk called reservation dogs which has just finished its Uh, third season what good things about that fantastic so good it's produced by taika waititi and it's about uh teenagers growing up on a um, native american reservation in oklahoma um which sounds very gritty and realist and kind of depressing but is actually it's one of the funniest, uh, most kind of heartfelt shows I've seen in years. And I think it also has a, a lot of kind of speculative elements. The, there's various visions and people, um, characters interact with their ancestors in ways that are both hilarious and heartbreaking. It's a fantastic show. 
Um, what's the what's yeah. the speaking of gritty reservation? What's the film with Jeremy Renner? Um, uh, where Elizabeth Olsen? Yeah, uh, uh, is it white ice. something? But basically, it's like an incredibly like it's quite hard to watch as a film, but also has yeah. the tensest. I think it's wind possibly river. the t- wind, wind river. That's river, it. Yeah. yeah. The tense oh, yeah, standoff, that, yeah. Yeah. Ten, tense yeah. standoff scene at the that's, end that's is incredible. Honestly, Taylor Sheridan, yeah. I'm like a, I'm becoming a massive, massive fanboy of his stuff. I think I didn't see. realize that Reservation Dogs was Taika Waititi as well. Like I'd heard good things about it, but I didn't. He's have... a he's a producer on it. Yeah, he didn't he didn't write it, but him. Okay, because I used I, I used to be a kind of like. I used to be a. I will watch anything that Taika Waititi writes and directs for, and then I watched Thor: Love and Thunder, and then I no longer feel that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> um, but I'm still interested by him as a as a creator. Yeah, yeah, um, I, I heartily recommend that. Um, I've got two more. Uh, yeah. So the Peripheral, I really enjoyed the adaptation of the William Gibson uh, first book in the the kind of agency series. Which, um, if we're going to apply punk labels to everything, I would call this like extruder punk it's this kind of the bourbon 3d printed um you know this weird internet of things enabled universe but also simultaneously like all massively wacky and about multiple uh, realities and stuff like that and I, I it was another show that made a lot of changes from the book but in a really interesting way um i think it got canned it by amazon which is a real thing, problem yeah. yeah which kind of sucks and the last one is uh, something i haven't seen but which i have seen everywhere people talking about which i really want to see for next year which is a show called scavengers rain uh, which is currently only available in the us um, i've heard of it check the trailer out because it's about a crew of people who are marooned on a planet and have to figure out uh, how to survive on that on that planet by interacting with the flora and fauna that live on that planet and that's literally all i know about it but every person that has seen it there's a bunch of people in various discords I'm in who have seen it, and they're all like, "This is the best thing I've I've seen in 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 a in a year or more." Um, and I really want to watch it, but I don't know when it's going to come. Oh to the UK. yes, I have read about this, and I had to, and I've and I can't find it in the UK at all. It's yeah. an animated one. Yeah, and I'm like, I, I I would buy it if it was available. I'd subscribe to the service to watch it because it's uh, it looks fantastic. Yeah, excellent. Right. Well, um, before I ask you my final Christmas-based question, um, since we are a writing podcast and we've kind of veered away from that a little bit, um, <laughs> uh, at the very end, just uh, one thing that you're looking forward to writing-wise in 2024, uh, and we'll start with Dave. Possibly I'm a book coming forward. out, potentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm looking forward way. to... I'm looking forward to the book coming out. I'm looking forward to all the attendance stuff that will go to that. Because one of my highlights last, or this year, I guess, earlier this year, was going to Next Launch. Like, Next Launch was in Edinburgh was fantastic. And because there was a bunch of people uh, from my writing group there, there was a bunch of people from ESFF, the server that we're all on. Um, and I'm looking forward to having that experience myself, hopefully. And also going to Harrogate, going to Bloody Scotland, and starting to make connections. Because, you know, I, I write sci-fi, but I also write thrillers. And I kind of have spent four or five years building up connections and meeting people in the, in the sci-fi world. And now I'm basically not quite start starting from scratch, but I'm, I'm starting to do the same thing in the, in the crime and thriller world. And I think launching my book will be hopefully the start of uh, establishing myself in, in that world. So I'm looking forward to that. Excellent. What about you, Nick? Uh, Dave's book coming out. Um, <laughs> is Thanks, man. I on the list. Um, I'm looking forward to that immensely. And it's going to be a crack and launch um whatever we do for it um i'm looking forward to Worldcon, which is going to be in glasgow mm. um of course Shit. which is going to be <laughs> that. uh in the summer um so that's that's it's going to be my first world con um and i'm looking forward to it immensely um yeah i'm looking forward to some things to do with my writing as well uh some things that i can't really talk about uh that i'm looking forward to but some th- possibly possibly my next book coming out uh we haven't got we haven't got a strict pub date yet but it's either going to be end of 2024 or beginning of 2025 so if it's it might be in the next year but if not it'll be very shortly afterwards it's but the books with editors at the moment it's it's we're on a kind of editing schedule like we're working through it but when the exact pub date falls has not been set a hundred percent stone yet 
but hopefully maybe another one of my books coming out too brilliant what about you Tarek? uh from my own point of view um i've got some books um which i've signed which i have uh, not been announced yet but they are not till 2025 so i suppose i'm looking forward to kind of like firming them up and getting them finished and ready to go uh next year um and working with a couple a few different 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 folk in the publishing world who i'm really excited to work with um next year which should be good um and but the book i'm looking forward to coming out next year is all the colors of the dark by chris whitaker um oh yeah i like his stuff a lot yeah, i really yeah, I really loved we begin at the end um which came out a couple of years ago now. I yeah, think. that was a great um, book. I really yeah, I thought it was book, absolutely yeah. phenomenal. And and apparently, uh, all the colors of the dark is like super dark and emotional, and just meant to be a really good like kind of serial killerish. I think I'm not read it, so I don't know, but it, it's meant to be awesome. And I'm very much looking forward to reading that. I think it's out in March next year. Excellent, excellent. What you, Marco? What's your uh, for finishing this book? That's my. That's, that's hopefully going to be my highlight, or it will be my low light when I fail to do so. But you know, I'm forty five thousand words down. So hope, you'll, you'll be. Hopefully, you'll be I'll get there. That. Yeah. No, finishing that and then seeing what happens with it. You know, as as Dave said, you know, these things sometimes don't don't end up going anywhere. But it's all part of the process, and it will be exciting. You have to believe, though, man. With every yeah, yeah. book that goes out, you have to believe, even if it doesn't. You gotta. I mean, gotta have it's to see. the greatest book ever written. So I've got no yeah, I mean, no doubts whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> um no, that's but, super exciting. It's gonna be it'd be amazing, yeah, seeing that the you know, wheels kick in and you know what happens with that and pitching it to publishers, etc. That's super exciting. Stuff. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And yeah, yeah, I will be asking for you all to be to read it. So uh, I'll be sort of, of slightly hiding as I hand it out and hoping that it's not Looking terrible. But yeah. Yeah. um uh, but last thing I wanted to ask you, and I did warn you all about this, so uh, I hope you all have an answer. Uh, your favourite Christmas movie? Oh yes. Uh, so we will start with Nick. Uh, mine is so I I actually don't like a lot of Christmas movies. <laughs> um, and so you the know, Grinch, it, it, then, it depends on. Your... <laughs> <laughs> I love Christmas. Uh, in it, as you can tell by my many accoutrements and my elf. Um, but um. Yeah, so so um, it depends what you define as a Christmas movie. Like there are some things which have been, yeah. you know, uh -huh. you call Die Hard a Christmas Sorry, movie. It's yeah, not really about so. Christmas. That happens at Christmas time, you know. But but it kind of is. Um, so my favorite Christmas movie is absolutely um, Trading Places, oh, uh, nice. which yeah. is a wonderful movie. I've not seen that for uh, years, actually. I must yeah, sure. but apparently, and I don't know if you can speak to this, Marco. I've only discovered this relatively recently, and I've I've loved the movie for years. But apparently, it's got a real massive cult following in italy at christmas oh is that right I yeah know, I it, was, it, was, it was on the i was reading it on the wikipedia article for it some months ago for some reason i don't know why i was doing some wikipedia browsing um and it was saying that uh apparently there's this huge thing where italians watch trading places on christmas eve um <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> very specifically i, I, um, like I don't have to do that on christmas um eve, right? Is that so, like the whole the whole of Germany sits down and watches some random British comedy from the nineteen fifties? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, it's, right. it, the yeah, whole yeah. of Germany watches this really weird. Drunk and drunk I watched it. The 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 yeah, this comedy where he keeps trying to pour the drinks and he keeps yeah. getting drunk and drunk. He drinks the drinks for everyone. Yeah. He's not yeah. There, yeah. Um, really bizarre. Yeah. But yeah, so apparently, Training Places is watched by tons of people in Italy on Christmas Eve. Uh, but it's also a great film. And it like, is. Yeah, oh. yeah, very. Like, there's there's a I can think of a scene in that where. The first time I saw it, I just couldn't stop laughing. It it just comes, and it's like a scene that is. It's not one of the main comedy bits. It's just a throwaway line, and it was just brilliant. Do you, do you want to know the, the 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 highly lauded Christmas film? I hope it's none of your three. The highly lauded Christmas uh -oh. film that is supposedly a comedy that I've never laughed at once, and I I cannot. <laughs> You're going to say it. the film that is. I'm going to say. I can tell. But anyway, go for it. <laughs> is Elf. <Yeah. laughs> Yeah, is it your film? I can't, yeah. just, can't get on with it, Marco. I can't. We were, I'll come back to why you're wrong about that in a moment. But uh, Dave, <laughs> okay, what's we'll your... talk about it. We'll hash it out. <laughs> what's your... So I have a complicated answer, which I will go through quickly so that you don't challenge me. Um, so uh, I'm married to an American. So to, uh, if, you, if you're judging purely by rotation, 
a number of times I've seen them, um, it's probably It's a Wonderful Life and Christmas Story, which are the two I big like Christmas American, Story a lot, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Christmas Story. There's so many things in it that are very American references that I don't really get, if I'm honest. But um, I've watched it enough times now that I mostly, mostly understand what's going on. But it's a classic. It's good. And it's weird because it's made in the 80s, but has the vibe of having been made in the 50s. It's kind of a strange movie. Um, it's a wonderful life. Absolute classic. Yeah. You know, um, if you don't cry when the the uh, the bell Angel. rings at the end, yeah, then you're, exactly, you're, yeah. you're not, you're not a, a real person. Um, and then the, but my, my probable actual favourite and the one we watched this year when we were putting the tree up is uh, Muppet Christmas Carol. Oh, oh, yeah, the only it. Phenomenal choice. Know. And and the best part about it is that um, Michael Caine plays the entire movie completely straight. Yeah. Yes. He's surrounded yes. by Muppets. Totally he, You know, he just plays it right down the line. He's like, I'm going to treat this like Shakespeare and it's fantastic. Two very, very quick anecdotes. <laughs> uh, that... Um, my 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 son uh is now uh five uh, and my daughter's three and watching obviously Mupp- Mupp- muppet's christmas carol is perfect christmas film for that and just having for most of december um my son going around the house going we're marley and marley <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> just like constantly around the house it's been very insane but it made me discover that there's actually a very large contingent of people out there who their first exposure to a Christmas Carol is the Muppets Christmas Carol. And then they later in life read a Christmas Carol and they realize that Jacob Marley was of course only one person and not two people. And it <laughs> blows their mind. This is a big thing that happens to a lot of people where they realize that, that the Marley brothers were, were entirely a Muppet creation. Yeah. It's fantastic. You see the, um, the live show of that with like the orchestra last Christmas in Usher Hall. And oh, it was amazing. amazing. And they'd found a cut well of the film with that song reinserted which made my Christmas because it's all I mean, annoyed amazing. me to cut that song out because I'm going to get a big rant about this because they, they reference it at the end because the song they cut out is called When Love Is Gone and the song at the end at which they, they keep in is called When Love Is Found and it makes no sense to keep in the final song yeah. without yeah. the original song that it's referencing. It does, yeah, that's annoying. Anyway. that's annoying. And I've got one tiny bonus recommendation, which is uh, very quickly, uh, very called, quickly. Yep. Yeah, sorry, it's called Klaus on Netflix. Oh, that's yeah, great. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Klaus. Hilarious, brilliant. beautiful yeah. animation, Christmassy without being overly uh, Christmassy about it. It's great. It's, yeah, fantastic. Uh, Tarek. Okay, very quickly, my Christmas movie of greatest of all time. You can take your It's Wonderful Life and stick it. It's Jingle All The Way with Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Genuinely yeah. fucking love this film. I know it's crap, Old but choice. I absolutely love it. Like, I'm a massive Arnie fan, and I just I watch it every Christmas, and it's just so stupid, and I, I can't get enough of it. I just love it. Well, yeah, I mean... That, that, that's... I almost went for that, to be honest, Eric. <laughs> you bring up another thing, which is Christmas films also become films that you will always watch at this time of year. And one, you know, yeah. Lord of the Rings trilogy is a big... I associate that with Christmas. I don't, did they come out around Christmas? They came Christmas? out at Christmas. Yeah. Like, it was the, but the certainly end, I I've watched in more than one Christmas. I've watched, we've sat down and watched them all and extended edition right off. I've just like finished re-watching the, 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 all three, actually. Uh, yeah. We started at the beginning of December. We did a little chance, but I've just finished watching uh, the, the full trilogy. Nice. Um, but, yeah, I mean, well, actually, both of the movies I was going to say have been, have been mentioned. So Elf, I maintain, is... Good. Um, I love Elf. Elf like I, I love. I, I have to say, I'm a big Will Ferrell. Er, early Will Ferrell fan. I uh, I like Will Ferrell as well. Yeah, like I yeah. love Anchorman. I think it's hilarious. Yeah. Um, I'm a bit. I just it's something about Elf that just the comedy doesn't. I end. just I, I like I quite like his interaction with uh, James Can as as the angry dad, uh, just getting yeah. more and more frustrated. <laughs> um. Uh, so yeah, I, I I enjoy that one. I also I was going to say feeling which. Uh, Klaus is a new, it's relatively new, but it's sort of Santa, the origin story, I guess. But um, yeah. uh, again, that's a film at the end of it, at the very last line, uh, always brings tears to my eyes as well. So it's, it's you know, it is just a lovely, it's funny, but heartfelt, great animation. So I highly recommend that one as well. So actually, I do, there's, there's one oh, bit yeah, that I still a lot in Elf, and it's, um, 
it's the early early Peter Dinklage showing up in the yeah. uh, at the end of the film, just being like, <laughs> see that hey, I, see I get more action more than time. you get in a week, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. well, whatever. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 wonderful. Yeah, um, that is good. Yeah, I like that bit. <laughs> um, see, there's lots of bits like that. It's good, but anyway, never mind. <laughs> Uh, we have gone on way longer than we anticipated, but that's because it's been a great chat. Uh, really enjoyed having you both on, so thank you for coming on and and Did chatting. Enjoy having having me here too, Michael. Well, I mean, I kind of had to. Yes, in the default. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we will be back with regular, although a slight. We're we're looking to slightly refresh the format of the podcast soft and that reboot the soft reboot uh, which will come back uh, uh, early in the new year um but in the meantime if you're listening to this before christmas have a great christmas and new year or you know have happy holidays all that sort of stuff and as i say we will be back um for the start probably early january uh, sorry late january early february next mm -hmm. year with another great batch of episodes and brilliant guests to help you in your writing journey but thanks very much for tuning in well i hope you enjoyed that episode if you did please leave a comment down below hit that thumbs up button and be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below and if you want to get in touch you can always drop us a tweet in the twitter machine which is at uk page one as evidenced here and our other social media channels are available Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later. Bye.